Come on, let's share it due to the spirit of expectancy. That is for Elizabeth, Liz, Terry, um, who is the driving force behind um, this, this occasion with the launch of Entrepreneur Social. I'm sure uh, will in time prove to be a very valuable addition to the social enterprise landscape of this blessed country. Now clap your hands again. An even greater expectation than I tell you what you're clapping for. That is for you, whether you are in this room or you are um, joining by social media, because um, today is indeed the first day of the rest of your life. That is how I feel about social entrepreneurship and social enterprise. And if I were going to wax poetically, or more likely romantically, I would say I was living a life and I thought I was doing well and I was enjoying myself and I was making money. And uh, there's one time I would say, and then I met Sandra. <laughs> and the rest was history. But since she is no longer with us, I think she would understand and forgive me if I said, and then I discovered social entrepreneurship, <laughs> or social entrepreneurship discovered me. Uh, life is amazing, and you rise to the top of your profession, like I did in, in Jamaica in, 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 in business consultancy. And then you go to the Nazareth of Jamaica, Nazar in the Greek, uh, which is a place that is dismissed, avoided. Um, in the Bible, when Nathaniel was told about Jesus from Nazareth, his question was, can anything good come out of Nazareth? <laughs> this Jesus is going to have to prove himself to me before I give him ratings. And then you make what your friends think is a capricious decision. Your clients, since I was a, uh, a strategic planner, one particular client said, you know, you plan for our company in 20 year horizons and now you have moved to a community where your lifespan has considerably shortened. And um, I have lived long enough to prove many of the naysayers wrong. I am going to be sharing with you briefly, but I hope meaningfully, on this topic, my trench town journey. If that sounds familiar, maybe it's because you recall um, a book which was authored by Colin Powell, the head of the Joint Chief of Staff in the United States who has Jamaican antecedents, and he wrote a book which is called My American Journey. But this one is my trench town journey Lessons in Social Entrepreneurship and Community Transformation for Development Leaders, Academics, and Practitioners. If that sounds as if it's a title for a book, then you're absolutely right. I'm presently immersed in writing a book that I think will be very helpful to the um, and will be a useful addition to the literature on social entrepreneurship. I first shared these thoughts in a presentation at the Eisenhower House, on the, and which is part of the White House complex, some years ago, and also for the, um, for, for the IDB in, in Washington. And last year, right here at UTech, in their 60th anniversary distinguished lecture series 
I happened to be um, a speaker and I also shared um, a semblance of what I'm going to share today. Next. Now, let me begin by just sh sharing with you some of what um, others are saying about us, lest it seems that I am blowing my own horn. This came from the Public Defender's Report into the May 2010, uh, you know, Tivoli security operations. I doubt if anybody listening to me would have read the Public Defender's Report. Uh, and even if you have read it, I don't think you would have gotten to page 177, <laughs> where he was searching to solutions so that we would probably not have a repeat of that uh, particular mayhem. And the topic that he writes on the most was not the one on which the most money was spent, which was the public inquiry. Do you all remember that? Oh, yes. And how long it went yes. on? And by the way, I was not one of the consultants who was privileged enough to earn enough to retire on <laughs> <laughs> by appearing before that tribunal. But um, from page 177 to about 182, he, he, he gave a pre pre pretty accurate description of agency for inner city renewal. And this is what he said, the AIR approach offers something of a template sustainable social and economic development of Tivoli Gardens and West Kings and it aims to promote self-reliance by tapping into the energy muscle creativity and ingenuity of the people and he concluded that application of the air model would um, comparati be comparatively cost effective requiring minimal state outlet, and its success would greatly weaken the pervasive influence of political dons, rendering them increasingly redundant. Wouldn't you love to have that said about you? Yes, indeed. Well, the proof of that is if I could walk out of here right now and walk into Trenchtown without any bodyguard, into Tivoli, and any of those communities, what do you say, my friend? Could I do it? Yes, sir. You've seen it happen. <laughs> so, that, you know, was, um, was, was the insight. It was how one very important organization Jamaica, in Jamaica saw um, agents of our inner city renewal. Then, also, um, a couple of years ago, The Economist magazine, um, Schumpeter, who is one of their main writers, and of course, you know, The Economist magazine is possibly the most um, recognized even revered magazine of its type in the Western world. And they wrote a story um, called Island Story, in fact, about Jamaica, in which they lamented that Jamaica is so blessed, you know, and they even mentioned some names, like Boots Stewart and, and other iconic figures, and lamented, why is it that Jamaica continues to, um, to suffer the kind of social and economic problems that it does. Don't you sometimes wonder? Yes. I think every Jamaican uh, wonders about that. And just about when one would become, you know, a little bit uh, depressed and whatever, then they started to say that Jamaica is even learning from global models in dealing with two of its biggest problems, poverty and crime. Poor areas such as Trenchtown used to be run by government bosses uh, uh, whose job was to bring benefit notable public housing in return for votes. We know that as a garrisoning process, right? Today, social entrepreneurs of a different model uh, use methods drawn from global business, and that is in fact the operating definition of social entrepreneurship. It's people like myself, and in my former life as a business consultant, what did I do? 
my job was to make rich men much richer. That's actually what I did. And when I arrived in Trenchtown, a community from which I do not come, uh, my first thing was, you know, maybe God has put me here to become poor, to give away this, you know, the, the fruit of my hard work and my very prudent lifestyle. And then God had other plans. He said, do exactly what you do for those rich people. Make my poor people richer. How am I going to do that? He said, what do you think I've been training and preparing you for all of these years? It was for this moment. Use the same methods. There's no time to teach an old dog new tricks. Not sure if God would use those, that exact language to describe his most precious creation, a human being. But that was it. And, 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 and so this, in fact, is the definition. They go say Henry Morgan, a consultant, has established a social company, the agents for the city renewal air, complete with a CEO, chairman, various business divisions to try to revive Trenchtown. And it provides training, acts as middlemen between companies, uh, locals and teaches people how to establish businesses and it has also formed an alliance with companies like Sagicor. So if you drive in our compound in Trenchtown, you will see a Sagicor office, you see a crazy gym, you'll see different things as we partner with different institutions uh, which are accepted in mainstream economy to bring um, services and hopefully wealth to the community. Trenchtown is no longer a war zone. That might have been a little bit uh, prophetic. Uh, <laughs> but actually, when you look at the statistics on crime, <coughs> Trenchtown does have the fastest declining homicide rate in the world. It's just that if one incident happens there, it makes front page, huh? because of the, um, you know, the stereotypical way in which a community is treated. And it mentioned that a few intrepid tourists are now venturing in. Starting November 15 this year, it won't be a few intrepid tourists uh, because one of our, um, our subsidiaries, which is Jamming Tours, which is owned and operated by nine wonderful women living in or associated with Trenchtown, uh, signed with sandals to start bringing tourists into Trenchtown. Wow. Now, next one, next slide. I just try to stay in frame here. Now, it's very important as a backdrop to the presentation to talk a little bit about the location and demographics of the community because social entrepreneurship is not something really made for Wall Street or for, you know, uptown where they have wonderful gated communities and send their kids to the best schools. Social entrepreneurship really shows up and shows off in the more depressed communities of the world. It's like somebody said to go where, you know, only fools venture, you know, and angels fear to tread. That's where you find the entrepreneur off the beaten track. And, and so it's located within the downtown development cluster. It has five districts and a population of about 27,000 in those five contiguous districts. And, and, um, and of course, we know the development needs. These are pretty commonplace in communities of that type. High levels of youth unemployment, limited opportunities for training, high levels of high school dropout, poor parenting, high levels of crime and violence, substandard infrastructure, and, and social services. Typical inner city, and no amount of putting lipstick on a pig, such as referring to these communities euphemistically as winner cities, will change that, right? Only hard work, people taking risk, People using the social entrepreneurship model can, can deal with those issues. But here is what's important. It also has assets, not just liabilities. 
The way these communities are commonly described, it has assets too. And for instance, young trainable population, uh, cultural and musical heritage. Trenchtown, of course, is the birthplace of reggae and rocksteady and much of the culture. Wide range of educational institutions, churches and civil society institutions, and it is an international brand. As a matter of fact, it is said that Trenchtown is a more recognizable name uh, worldwide than the capital of Kingston. Do you believe it? Yes. Do you believe it? Yes. That is probably true. Next one. So our company, I have not been there yet for 25 years. <laughs> Um, the registration was just 2008, and the company recently changed the mode of registration. I want your listeners, viewers, to understand it. It's a company limited by guarantee with a share capital. Most NGOs, non-government organizations, not-for-profit organizations, are companies limited by guarantee for charitable purposes. Now, I got to uh, admit that um, one of the real battles I had upon arriving in Trenchtown, and, 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 and I hope you take this in the context uh, that it's meant, was that I found that I, I, I could not even speak certain words. For instance, I am struggling now to use the word not-for-profit. To me, a not-for-profit is a hermaphrodite with both sexual organs that cannot impregnate itself. Wow. I make no commentary on the organizations that are not-for-profit. But because of my prior experience and conditioning, are you with me? Yes. Uh, dealing on the wealth side of the, of the continuum. Uh, and I do work for many not-for-profits and whatever, which... Um, do good work, but using resources provided elsewhere. I call it the Mother Teresa model. Uh, but it, when it came time for me to choose, I chose something else. So very important to understand the options in Jamaican law for registration. Next one. Um, now, I want to just make a case for a new approach to community transformation through social enterprise. And I will do that very briefly. Why don't we continue as we have done? You know, a wise man said, it's a fool who keeps doing what he is doing and expect different results. Do, do we like what's happening in Jamaica? I, I remember that fateful day when my office in New Kingston, the staff started to get very nervous uh, because they noticed my whole countenance and my attitude was changing. And I kept saying that we were not going to continue in this life. And they knew I was either going to migrate or do something strange. I don't think they thought I would have done something like say, we're going to move to Trench down. And there was a fateful day when my staff kind of, you know, ganged me up and said, Dr. Morgan, don't you think it's time you take us to this place where we're spending money to build an office? And I remember as if it were five minutes ago, driving down Beechwood Avenue, and my secretary in the front seat says, don't you notice, sir, that everybody is going in the opposite direction except <laughs> us. Now, if you know me, you know I have a right sense of humor, and I can be very cynical, and my answer is, do you, do you not like the way in which Jamaica is going? I said, no, of course not. I said, maybe that we are the only people that's heading in the right direction. Oh my God. There's almost some, a tinge of emotion with that. So locally, low ROI on GOJ, multilateral and bilaterally funded interventions. Since independence, may have spent over 50 billion United States dollars trying to make our communities better, trying to reduce crime and violence. 
I put it to you that the problems are worse today than at the beginning. Maybe the money should have been spent digging graves or something like that and making burial grounds or whatever. The problems are worse today. Just three weeks ago, two, less than three weeks ago, the Minister of National Security, Dr. Chan, Horace Chan, Honorable Dr. Horace Chan, created some controversy by saying the social interventions that have been used in Montego Bay, and he extended it to Jamaica, have not worked in deterring the producers of violence. Globally, failure of the UN member countries to meet the MDG target. Before the, social, the SDGs, there were the MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals, before the Sustainable Development Goals, which was to uh, have poverty in the world by 2015. The world failed spectacularly. Now, actually, the goal was met, but only because China was able to bring so many people out of poverty. Are uh, you with me? But outside of China, the goals were not met, so they came up with a successor, SDGs, which is going to try again by 2030. So the old method has not worked. So we're in search of a new way. So here comes the social enterprise model. And before I go on to the lessons learned, um, let, let me say, I first started to describe myself as a social entrepreneur as a cover for my family, just to preserve a modicum of respect and dignity. People are already talking about Dr. Henley Morgan, who left a very profitable job and is gone down to this community where he's going to leave his family husbandless and fatherless. And even myself one time thought it was kind of a spiritual experience and I was going to emerge as the modern day John the Baptist, uh, you know, with Nazarene, with dreadlocks, but I, I quickly had to give that up because of genetic um, issues beyond my control. But at least I would have on a frowsy robe and some sandals and just be a malcontent, you know, a Garveyite, which I am. I even started to think that, you know, in the whole evolutionary process, I didn't know which way I would come out. So I started to say when people would ask me, whenever I would emerge from Trenchon, I would say I'm a social entrepreneur. Never knew what it meant. It just sounded good. But then I think many people will say maybe in Jamaica, I am the first person they have heard use that term in a very public way. And over time, I have come to own it and to hone it and to, to use it as, the, as the, the vehicle for doing what God has purposed in my life. So I have learned at least 10 lessons. And in my book, these are being presented as chapters. And lesson number one is every community has within it the seeds of its own redemption. Before this journey began, I thought that there were some communities that maybe, as one politician put it, were irredeemable. And one of the first and most important lessons I have learned is that where there is an infection in the body, the white blood cells rush to that site and they, they bring about, um, uh, you know, a cure. So every community has within it the seeds of its own redemption. And inner city communities have great advantages, um, which in a longer lecture, I would be happy to enumerate these. So that is a very important lesson which puts you on the threshold of social entrepreneurship, where you're no longer just looking at the liabilities and think that all you gotta do is work at solving problems, but it has assets. So lesson number two is the emphasis on assets and liabilities. 
You know every balance sheet has assets and liabilities, huh? And what I found is that the old way, which is why $50 million have not brought us success, the expenditure has not brought us success, is that as a consultant, I must admit I made a fair amount of money um, doing what is called needs analysis. Um, the multilateral and bilateral agencies were always very ready to pay a consultant to go in and do a needs analysis. And the longer the list of needs were, the greater. But what happened when you come up with a need is that you only have two options. It looks so bad. One is either to set fire to the whole place or to impose uh, solutions from outside, which leads to clientelism and, and, and a dependency. So here it is, we're discovering that there really are assets. So we start to doing what is called asset mapping. So what is an asset? An asset is, just as it is in business, is something that has value. And like in business, if you leverage the assets, you will get an outcome, which is usually wealth. Very important. Lesson number three is give precedence to national and global priorities. And let me tell you this. And I, and I, I, I was saying on the way up here, this public persona that I have is wonderfully and beautifully contrived. My wife was a marketing specialist and myself sat down at one time. She said, you know, Henley, being entrenched down now, you can't leave people up to their own perceptions about what you are. Some people may think you are done. Do you like to be a righteous don? And she said, furthermore, you can't every time you emerge from here, somebody see you and say, my goodness, we heard you had gone to trend. I haven't seen you for a long time. And they take out a donation to give to you. So we crafted a strategy by which I would become the most known face in Jamaica. Have I succeeded? Radio programs, TV programs, writing columns, the watchman. Hey, I'm an introvert. I prefer go home early and lock myself away in the room and not be bothered by people after dealing with them all day. But one thing for sure, you got to be in this public space, all right? You got to be out there. And you try not to win sympathy, but you try to have people respect what you're doing and to win compassion. Because sympathy, they just feel sorry for you. Compassion, they move to help you. And one way you do that is that though is to think global, but act local. So if you read our uh, documents, you will notice that we give precedence to the SDGs, absolutely. Jamaica is a signatory to that with about 176 UN countries. And we give precedence to Vision 2030. So when you reach our strategic plan, it says Vision 2030, Jamaica, French town. Are you see? So when you go to meet with multilaterals and bilaterals, if you're just talking about trench town, they just fall asleep. They say there are 10,000 communities like that. Actually, 650 in Jamaica. But um, it is extremely important to, however, while thinking global, thinking national, make sure you act local. Lesson number five. Lesson number four, sorry. Develop a shared vision, mission, and set of goals. You, you, so our vision, our mission is to transform zones of social and economic exclusion to zones of opportunities, investment, and wealth. If you really read it, that's powerful, right? By the way, the first way of knowing if an organization is a social enterprise, read their mission statement. 
Now, if you listen to it, it's really a de garrisoning thing. It really is. But you have to be very skillful, you know, because politicians are very sensitive, and many of them who created this, um, this amazing human contrivance um, that if we're not careful, will last a thousand years, are still alive. And so they're very sensitive. So I will just say that and move on. Number five, choose the appropriate strategy and approach. So I have found that what has helped me a lot is not just the fact that I work to make rich men richer, but that I was a strategic planner. I find that the strategic planning model is absolutely relevant to the social enterprise model. If you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. So vision, mission, strategies, goals, actions and interventions. You gotta do it. Because one thing I can tell you in Trenchon, every day you wake up, the first set of people you meet, you get the agenda for the day. I remember one day just driving into my, I saw some people, a 14 year old girl had been murdered in the very back of my property. And that all of a sudden was a national thing. That was never uh, reported in that way, right? Because I know when not to appear before the cameras as part of, you know, a building brand trench now. But the first person you meet could give you your agenda for the day. So you never really get to work, are you with me, on the bigger picture. So it's very important that you do this and that you choose the right strategy and that you have a larger group like the community being part of that vision. That is not just your own idea of what you want to do or you think is best for the community or else you'll just be a little bit better than those before who came from the needs analysis paradigm. Select the right people. I, I, we, we were in the office today and our team, I dare any organization, name them. My, my, that has a better team than we do. I have a chief financial officer who is an MBA and um, a, a CEO who is a chartered accountant and an MBA finance, a chief administrative officer who is an MBA. Knowledge is the most important weapon in fighting against complex problems. Is this a commentary on the representation we have in Parliament? You know? Um, because Einstein, one of the best thinkers ever, said, you cannot solve a problem at the same level of thinking you were at when you created it. Uh, are you hearing me? So you've got to bring not just passion, not just compassion, not just energy, you've got to bring intellect. Because these problems, like garrisons, garrisons, political garrisons are complex. And we have an absolutely excellent team. Um, and I'm not saying degrees are the only measure of intellectualism, <laughs> but these universities don't exist for nothing. So you've got to select the right team, and not just in terms of qualification, but they have to have the right zeal. They have to have a heart for this kind of work. You can't in Trenchtown have employees and people working with you who are looking back over their shoulders as like to Solomon Gomorrah or hankering after what would have been if they had worked with some corporate entity. And that is one of the reasons why when we made the decision to move to Trader, people said at least keep an office. I closed the office down because that focused me. I had nowhere to run. 
I could have justifiably spent many, many days outside if I had kept an office in New Kingston, for example. Lesson number seven. Partnerships are essential. Partnerships are absolutely essential. Now, we, I thought we were being very innovative when we say we use the triple bottom line approach. So we use the church, the church gives salvation benefits, we have an NGO, the NGO gives social benefits, and we have uh, uh, the, the, the enterprise which gives financial benefits. And so view them as three concentric rings, and the more they converge, you get community transformation. Now, they have what is called the quadruple helix. That's a hot word now in social entrepreneurship. The quadruple helix, where you have academia, private sector, the, 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 the civil society, and, and, and government working in unison. And we are moving to that model. So for instance, in another few days, uh, AIR will be signing, we offer an MBA degree in social entrepreneurship already with UCC, the only community in Jamaica, in the Caribbean, to offer its own social MBA in social entrepreneurship. And right here at the University of Technology, reaching a global audience, certainly a regional one, we are going to be establishing our Institute of Social Entrepreneurship and Equity to teach short courses, credit courses, on how you can teach social entrepreneurship just like you teach business entrepreneurship. You can teach social enterprise such as you, same way you treat, um, you treat, you teach um, business enterprise, you can teach social enterprise. Out of this partnership, we now have, and I take no credit for it, but we now have legislation being developed to define what a social entrepreneurship is. It's, it's already in the MSME policy. We now in Jamaica have a social stock exchange and so on and so forth. Next one is prioritize actions and pick winners. You cannot be all things to all men. When we look in our operation, we have about 36 items that are pressing and urgent. So we have used the COVID Important Urgency Index. It's four quadrants. Quadrant one is important and urgent. Quadrant two, important but not urgent. Quadrant three, urgent but not important. Quadrant four, neither urgent nor important. So we look at our mission, our vision and stuff, and with each thing that's making a claim on our time and resources, we put it in one box, what the four boxes, okay? It's a very nifty approach to prioritizing activities. And we try as much as possible to stay in box number one. Next one. Lesson number nine, profitability and sustainability are key to survival and prosperity. Parity. The multilateral uh, agencies use the word sustainability. You write a proposal, they send it back, they say you're not sustainable. But they are not accustomed to the paradigm of profitability. One of the criteria for being a social enterprise is that you are profitable. You actually produce a profit. The difference, though, is what you do with the profit is that you reinvest it into the mission of the organization. And so, therefore, you have to start with that mentality that you want to generate profit. People come to Trench on all the time. Doc, we want to help you. Doc, we have, why do you want to do this? Nothing. I, I just want to do some good. I just want. You don't have to pay me. I don't have to do. Usually, I can't use those persons. I want people who come and say, I am hungry. I am hungry. I want to bring everything like Bill Gates did when he went to Bill and Melinda Gates found. I want to bring everything I have got. And I want to make money. 
but I want to make money for the people. Are you with me? And I want to also do well by doing good. That's the mantra of social enterprise. Doing well by doing good. There's no reason I have to dress any different than this uh, to show that I am a true altruist at the heart. No. Or by the car you drive or whatever. You can do well by doing good. And the final one is the heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. When it is all said and done, maybe in Jamaica we love poor people too much. For those politicians who are always saying they love poor people, maybe that's why we manufacture so many of them and we keep so many of them poor. The heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. And for Christians, we read Matthew 25, which says, On that day, when the Lord shall sit upon his throne, and we shall come before him to give an account, and we are very timid that we have failed every one of the Ten Commandments, and we are very timid that the seven things that God hates, which are recorded in Proverbs 6, are going to be held against us. We will have an experience like I have had throughout my many years of schooling, which is preparing for a test, and none of the questions I've studied for are on the test. Has that ever happened? I'm going to start by saying, I was hungry and without shelter. That's what it's going to be. You didn't provide me. You didn't take me. You didn't visit me when I was in jail. And that's what he's going to use to separate us. So to my audience, as I wrap up, I ask you to follow the urgings in your heart. One thing with social entrepreneurship, we do not have to do career counseling. It's already in your heart. It's already in your heart. Every human being who has been born has that deep, innate desire to leave a legacy. Am I telling the truth? Absolutely. Amen. To be known when your eulogy is read, not by how many bank accounts you have, which you can spend no more, not by how many houses you have had on a hill, not by the titles you have or the corner offices you occupy, but did you help make the world a better place? Now, let's just do this quickly, just to give you a visualization. Uh, the, 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 the video at the beginning was truncated, so you didn't get to see, but that's Trenchtown. Um, those are the high-rise buildings called Paradise Court. And it's amazing when people visit me and they say, I always picture it different. We have the Jamaica Music Institute, which is up in that building. It's a Pro Tools um, music, uh, high technology music recording uh, studio and certification um, um, laboratory. Next one. So that's it. Keep going. We have the Miracle Club, which I'm very proud of. And by the way, anybody can join the Miracle Club. We meet on weekends. We teach university level courses, no cost. People f tw uh, 18 to used to be 24. I think the average age now is in the 40s, right? Because knowledge is no respecter of age, right? So that's us. We do think that was the group of us who went to Washington, D.C. a couple of years ago. Um, you were there, were you? You were in that group. Wasn't it amazing? Yes. And we visited the ambassador to Jamaica's residence and, and oh, all of that. So we are constantly giving the community exposure. This is Cutis, uh, counseling unit for traumatized inner city early childhood students. My wife's last work in this life. So we have an early childhood institute there. You see the kids, that's over 300, 220. It has grown from just 80 students to over 230 in a couple of years. Look at that, that's Kevin Downswell. Next one. That's me. Uh, then 
we did the green, we tried with greenhouse. Um, go, go back. This one is my absolute favorite, this one. To see food security juxtaposed against modern housing. And this was it. By the way, we have not had the level of success with greenhouses, but the beautiful thing in social entrepreneurship and trench in particular is that we never use the word failure because there's no blueprint to follow. So everything we do is experimentation. What do you do in experimentation? You blow up the thing and you learn from it, right? So we, 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 we're not depressed, we keep going. We have the jamming singers. Uh, we've had that, you know, youths off the corner. We have had the Minimus Trench Town. We do that every two years with Pulse, um, right? This is one of the things we did that I was most proud of. It's called the Trench Town Trade and Investment Fair, which we did a few years ago at Emancipation Park. And of course, you see Marcus Garvey standing up large in it. I'm a, I like to think I'm a Garveyite. This is an attempt to bring micro enterprises into the mainstream of the economy. And people say, why didn't you do this in Trenchtown? I said, why couldn't we do it in New Kingstown? That's a bigger message, all right? We have jamming tours now, which I'm absolutely proud of. Um, some beautiful ladies, that's them. We are ton up the thing. Uh, I'm even learning the language. I'm learning the lingua. I used to say, we're turning up the thing. And they said, no, oh, Doc, you can not change <laughs> Right? So by the way, those ladies, they have three tours. One of them is called um, Come to Trench on and Learn for Bossa Dance. All right? Two and a half hours. Sign up for it. Right? I will not be your instructor. <laughs> we have another one called the Whalers Tour, which includes Culture Yard in Trenchtown. Bunny Whalers um, um, uh, place over in Washington Gardens, and of course, there's Peter Tosh at Pulse. Let me thank you very much. Um, I have gone above and beyond the time, but I hope you found the information useful, and if there are questions by the live audience, I will now take those. Thank you.